All right, here we go. To enhance our understanding of Earth system science, to conduct innovative, cutting edge research that is relevant, to educate the public, and to train the next generation of scientists. These are our goals and they are as true today as they were in our humble beginning. Our roots go back to 1943. British marine biologist Dr. Walton Smith started a small lab in a Miami beach boathouse. The University of Miami Marine Laboratory quickly evolved to become a sought after source for ocean and tropical environment research. Over the decades, our technical capabilities, resources, and achievements significantly expanded. Today, the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science is recognized as one of the world's leading academic oceanographic and atmospheric research institutions. Groundbreaking, transformational research generates new knowledge in every area of study, from marine biology and ecology to atmospheric sciences and ocean sciences, marine geosciences, and environmental science and policy. As we advance fundamental knowledge, we make valuable contributions to the scientific enterprise, while making an intentional effort to translate science into public outreach and environmental policy. Our renowned scientists and faculty lead research projects that address many challenges that our communities face today, including sea level rise, climate change, weather prediction, marine conservation, sustainable fisheries, hurricanes, and natural hazards and catastrophes, issues that affect us locally as well as on regional and global scales. From our notable advances in research to our superior academic programs and facilities, all of this has been made possible thanks to support from our many benefactors and competitive grants. Now, your support is more vital than ever because with it, we can propel scientific knowledge and our students to new boundaries, solving mysteries that will help us better understand the Earth's environment and its biodiversity, develop tools to better predict weather and changing climate, and further our understanding of its undeniable connection to our own prosperity. Our focus remains unchanged, to conduct cutting edge research while training the next generation of Earth scientists. that I'm going to try to chat with y'all about the undergrad stuff first. So let's move this over. All right. So we have six different majors um, in our our school. So the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, each each school has different majors that fall under it. So for us, we're going to start with the geological sciences. We offer a BS and a BA. Um, this is um, one of those majors that actually just moved over to us, uh, more focused on the earth, um, doing lots of work in volcanoes, on marine geosciences like coral work, um, earthquakes, etc. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot that's going on in the geological sciences. So if you have an interest in that, um, we've got a BS and a BA degree on that side. We have marine affairs which is gonna be a lot of work on policy and marine resources, economics, that kind of thing. Um, this is a BA degree. Um, let's go on. We've got a third one, marine biology and ecology. This is one of our newer majors that we have, um, but also one of our larger majors. Um, you will do work with corals and aplesia. There's possibility of working with marine mammals, um, ecology, biology, physiology, all these kind of linking together on that marine biology and ecology side. We've got a marine science double major where you're doing that marine science piece mixed with a second major, whether that be biology, chemistry, computer science, um, geological sciences, meteorology, microbiology, and immunology, and physics. So there's a lot of those different options so you, you could choose um, what that second major is going to be. And this is another one of our BS degrees. We've got a single major of meteorology. This is going to be that study of the atmosphere, climate change, weather forecasting. So if you're interested in going into that side 
of the house. There's a lot, a lot of work on that side. You're going to be doing a lot of work in uh, the physics and um, a lot of computer science, but it's really, really neat the stuff that they do related to hurricanes and severe weather. So if you're interested in that, um, obviously it's University of Miami, the hurricanes. Um, this is this is a great major to be a part of. And we have oceanography. Oceanography is another one of our newer majors, a focus kind of on the physical, chemical, and biological and geological ocean side of things. Um, this falls under our ocean sciences department. Um, we also do a lot of work where it kind of relates to the ocean side as it relates to weather and climate. So this is also a BS degree. Um, and this is, like I said, it's one of our newer majors as well. Also, if you're interested in like how currents work, this is one of those areas that would be a great, great focus. So at the University of Miami, we've got lots of different things with student involvement, lots of clubs and organizations, everything from the American Meteorological Society. When you're talking about your meteorology piece, we've got the Aquarium Club, we've got Marine Mammal Rescue Team, row, row, row. And actually at the University of Miami, the Scuba Club is the largest club on campus. So how neat is that? Obviously, our location is ideal where you get to go out in the water almost 365 days a year. You've got that propeller club at the top. I kind of waited on that one. I'm actually one of the advisors for that. So um, it's very neat. We have a great relationship with um, the Port of Miami. And so it's one of those where we work very closely with them, sponsored by a lot of the cruise line, shipping industry, et cetera. Um, lots of internships and research are, are available at the University of Miami as well. Um, these are just a handful of the opportunities um, doing manatee research, um, working with Moat Marine Lab over in Sarasota. Um, coral reef interns um, all over the place, even on our campus, obviously, we've got a lot of that research going on. Cayman Island, Oahu, um, estuaries and wetlands with London. So shark research, we do lots and lots of shark work. If you're also interested, sharktagging.com, that is part of our shark research and conservation group. They take on interns as well. Um, we also offer our summer scholars program. So any of the students who are in high school who are interested in taking some courses that can count towards your degree, uh, before you even get to campus to start your degree over at University of Miami, you can actually do that during the summer as well. Employment. So obviously, once students graduate, you've got lots of opportunities here. Um, everything from environmental consultants to fish biologists, ocean export specialists, etc. Um, to be honest, most of our students, though, do move on to graduate school, whether that's a PhD um, or a master's degree. And we'll talk a little bit about those options that we have as we keep going. Um, skip this because it's just for time wise so application information i know this is a big question for a lot of people um common application is what we use for everything and i should have updated this but sat act optional um going forward so even for fall 2022 it was optional um and i believe fall 2023 will be the same as well um you do need to complete the support submit two letter recommendation submit educational activities um, and then for those international students submitting those financial certifications, um, and then for domestic students, those financial aid documents, and of course your high school transcripts. So these are our deadlines, they're not changing. So whether you're looking four years from now, or if you're looking next year, these are our deadlines. Um, early decision one being November 1st and early action, November 1st, decision letters will go out um, in late December. Um, for early decision one, and then, you know, end of January, early February for those early action. The biggest question I always get is what is the difference? Early decision one is a binding contract. So that's one of those that if you are accepted and you put down early decision one, doesn't matter what other schools you put down, you're going to end up coming to University of Miami because that is a contract that you signed. Early action allows you to apply to a bunch of different schools. You're just going to find out a little bit earlier because you chose that early action. It is not a binding contract. Same thing though with early decision two, binding contract, it's just a little bit later down the line. And then of course our regular decision. I always tell people if you are interested in going to University of Miami, the best opportunity you're gonna have is that early decision one. Um, that's the first set of students that go through the process. If you get that um, opportunity to put early decision one and you are like, I'm gonna go to University of Miami if I'm accepted, I would highly, highly encourage you to put that early decision one option. So um, here's just a little bit of information for me. I'm going to keep going because I've got more slides for you. So um, there's that. Let's keep going, though. So I'm going to actually switch to the master side. And there's actually a piece for you undergrads, if you're interested, that there's a um, five-year degree where you can actually graduate with your undergrad 
and get your grad as well. So let's pull this one up and let's share that one. All right, so let's start with the assistantships. So this is where a lot of students are looking kind of going forward. So for, for you undergrads and you're interested in, in graduate school, our PhDs are listed every single year on our um, graduate assistantship page. It's the same link every single year for the past five years, and it's not going to change going forward. For us, fall 2022, which is this upcoming fall, is already filled for our PhDs, unfortunately. We actually closed our applications around January 8th. Um, for all of our apps, whether it's a PhD or a master's degree, no GRE is required. So GRE, not part of your submission, and actually some of our departments will not even look at a GRE if you submit it. So for us, it's really not worth it. Um, I'll talk about the one time where it might be worth it for you, but we'll, we'll talk about that as we get a little bit forward. Most of our PhD students are supported by graduate research assistantships. Those are going to be five years. Um, and each year it's going to pay $35,000 and it's going to pay for your tuition and your health insurance. So keep that in mind. That's a pretty good chunk of money for students who are looking for PhD opportunities. Um, there are only a handful of those that we offer per year, of course. We probably offered about 20 to 30 this year, so something to keep in mind going forward. For us, we do have spring and fall applications. Most of our applications are going to go during fall. So if you're thinking about submitting an app for spring or fall, I would highly encourage you to wait for the fall one because I would say 95% of our applications are, are being accepted during that time. So if you are looking for a fall start, though, make sure you turn in those applications as early as possible. December 1 is the priority deadline. Um, January 1 is kind of that final deadline. We usually extend it a couple days past January 1st just because, I mean, let's be real, we're off during that time. So, you know, it usually goes to like January 8th or something like that. We, we, we push it back a little bit, but try to get those in. I always push before December 1st. It gives those faculty during that holiday break um, winter holiday break to be able to kind of go through some of those applications. They will start interviewing students and some of them will even pick some of their students before that January 1 deadline even. So you want to just make sure you get that in. So these are some examples of what our fall 2022 assistantships were. Some of them will literally be the same for fall 2023, but a lot of these will switch out, but it'll give you an idea of some of the assistantships that we have throughout the year. So this is one that's brand new and it's going to stick with us for a long, long time going forward. It's our Environmental Science and Policy PhD program. So this program goes through the Abbas Center. The Abbas Center um, is really just trying to look for ways to be very interdisciplinary and try to help solve some of the world's problems. So we're talking about looking for those problems related to the ocean, um, coastal, terrestrial, climate change, um, problems and issues, long-term sustainability and resilience. So we are looking to try to solve some of those problems. This is the only assistantship that we that we do that there's a group or committee that meets together to kind of figure out who we're going to select. You're going to see going forward, there are individual faculty for the others, but for this one, it is a committee that meets. So if you've got one of those awesome um, world changing ideas, this would be that assistantship that you want to apply to. So for example, we had a student a couple of years ago who wanted to try to figure out what is the perfect coral that you could put to the ocean. And so when waves are coming through, it would slow down the wave action as it's approaching um, the shores, especially when hurricanes, for example, are coming through. So that student was working with marine biology, of course, when it relates to corals, but they were also working with engineering and architecture to figure out what does that layout look like for that coral. They were working with our ocean scientists because we have this huge sustained tank that can do hurricane winds up to like 200 miles per hour. Um, we've got um, atmospheric scientists, of course, working with, with the, those experts with hurricanes. So lots and lots of those different departments kind of layered together. And that's kind of what we're looking for, trying to get those interdisciplinary and work with all these different departments to be able to make sure we're getting um, solving those world's problems. Now, as you can see from this one, um, the rest are going to have a specific faculty member. So for example, Catherine Mock. Um, her, her assistantship is focused on flood risk and climate change preparedness. So we are really trying to figure out and look for um, who is going to match best with this faculty member. Um, they've applied for grants. 
they have this money that's come in from whether it's NSF or private grants, et cetera. And so they have a specific problem that they are trying to solve. They've put the grant out there and now they're hiring a PhD student to try to figure out what that solution is gonna be, right? So when you're submitting an application for a PhD, you wanna look and see, okay, what is that assistantship and how does my background fit best with what is gonna be here? Because remember, you're gonna be writing a statement of purpose. You're gonna be having letters of recommendation. You're gonna have all these pieces to your application. And we wanna make sure that it's gonna match up best with that faculty member. There's no committee that's reviewing this. Your application goes directly to that faculty member. So for example, if you submit an application and listed Dr. Catherine Mock as one of your top five faculty, she is getting your application and she's trying to see how you would match up best with this assistantship. Living Marine Resources Cooperative Science Center. This is Dr. Beth Babcock and Dr. David Da. Um, they do, we do a lot of work with NOAA. So for example, NOAA is across the street. I'm talking, you push a button, you walk across the street and there you are. You're at NOAA Fisheries and you're at AOML, which is the meteorological side um, for the Atlantic. So you've got all those pieces literally right there across the street. Um, they're so intertwined with us that even um, some of their members are on our listservs. So, I mean, there's lots and lots of work that we're doing with NOAA. And you'll see as we continue to move on. Um, this is another one with Dr. Beth Babcock, Science Support for Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management in the Gulf of Mexico. Ecology and Evolution of Giant Viruses. We've been seeing all the stuff with red tides and Florida red tides and, and lots of these fish and manatees, et cetera, are dying. So we're, we're obviously doing that research to try to figure out and to help solve some of those problems. This is one on toadfish. We have a toadfish lab over on campus. Um, and there's lots and lots of cool stuff that's going on with them. So this is just a specific um, assistantship with them. Like I talked about earlier, currents. Currents are a major, major part of ocean sciences. So this is one with Dr. Lisa Beal, Florida current and sea level. Here's another one, dynamics of the Agullis return current. And this is with Dr. Igor Kaminkovich. He actually is our program manager for, um, or head advisor for our, I think it's marine biology double majors. If not, it's marine biology and ecology. Amy Clement, um, examining the causes of trends in the context of variable subpolar North Atlantic Ocean. So she's one of our lead scientists when it comes to climate change. She actually sits on our sea level rise committee for um, the city of Miami. And so there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are being put into solutions for climate change. And so she's obviously one of those scientists who's sitting on the committee to make sure that the science piece is being looked at, um, as well as all the other parts. We've got constraining multi-scale interactions between slabs and mantle flow. This is with Dr. Adam Holt. We've got Dr. Cassandra Gaston on the atmospheric science side for impacts of atmospheric reactions on air quality. So she's got a really, really neat lab um, where we're actually collecting a lot of the dust that's coming over from the Sahara. So I'm sure y'all have seen all those Sahara dust plumes that are coming across the Atlantic Ocean. And so she's one of those faculty who is collecting that data. And we're talking about not just on our school campus, which we are, we literally have a thing that collects the dust on top of our roof over at our campus, but also in locations throughout the Caribbean. So I know we've got one in the Barbados as well, where it collects that dust, we go get all the information and then we start doing the research. Water vapor lakes over the tropical Indian Ocean with Dr. Brian Mapes. Investigating the role of metastable carbonates in the oceanic carbon cycle, Dr. Amanda Olert. She's been taking on a handful of students on the last couple of years. She's one of our newer faculty in the marine geosciences. Here's another one by her with shallow marine diagenesis in 3D. We've got Dr. Ben Kurtman on sub-seasonal to decadal predictability and prediction. So Dr. Ben Kurtman's a really, really cool guy. He actually um, is our director of CMIS. And CMIS is a Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies. So this is actually a way where there's money that's coming between NOAA and the University of Miami to help do research. So we've got over $300 million of money coming to the institution to do research and hiring PhD assistants and um, hiring students once they graduate to do all these different research pieces um, that, that you know, NOAA doesn't have enough people to do. So they're, they're kind of, in essence, outsourced it over to the university um, 
to, to be able to do some of that work. It's, it's awesome, awesome stuff. And there's so much work going on, obviously both on the meteorolo meteorology side and the fishery side. We've got satellite remote sensing of landfalling hurricanes with Dr. Roland Romeiser. He's actually also the, um, the advisor for our remote sensing track, which we're gonna talk about for one of our master's programs. We've got Dr. Lynn Shea. He's our associate dean for research and he's doing work on ocean atmosphere interactions during hurricanes. You can see there's a lot of work with hurricanes that we do. Obviously, hurricanes being a huge piece based off of location, et cetera. Um, knock on wood, we have not actually had a hurricane hit us in over 15 years. So we're hoping to keep that streak going as well. We've got Dr. Prakita Zudema, um, Arctic cold air outbreak, mixed phase cloud characteristics. We've got Dr. Brian Soden, who's got a handful of these opportunities as well. He is our associate dean for, um, for all of our graduate programs. So for our master of professional science, our master of science and our PhD, he is that associate dean. He um, is doing three assistantships this past year. He's always listing assistantships though. So if you're interested in these kind of areas, I would definitely reach out to him. Ocean heat uptake and global climate sensitivity, aerosol cloud interactions and global climate models, and radiative influence on tropical cyclone development. So this is a handful of those opportunities that we have from the PhD side of things. And like I said, if you're interested in PhD, we're closed for fall 2022, but we will be opening apps in August. So we're talking only about four or five months away from opening apps for fall 2023. I always encourage people, if you are looking to start um, reaching out to faculty, I would start reaching out about mid-May once classes are kind of done and we're just getting into summer, that's a good time to start reaching out to faculty. You don't really know if they have money or anything yet. So I think it's always better to start those conversations early rather than, oh, I see you've got some money available. Let me start having those conversations with you. Um, so before I go on to the Master of Professional Science, I actually want to play a quick video for you that's going to explain this degree program. So this program is really, really neat because it, um, it's really around to help people get jobs. That's the main goal of it. So let me play this and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between the master of science and master of professional science. And this is actually the degree in which um, students will get that five year master's degree as well if you end up going from that undergrad to grad. Arthur C. Clarke, writer of Stanley Kubrick's famous film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, famously pointed out how inappropriate to call this planet Earth what it is clearly ocean. As the human population continues to grow, we're stressing our blue planet and its resources in unprecedented ways. And if we're not careful, we could kind of screw it all up. At the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, an innovative graduate program provides students the opportunity to make a difference. The Master of Professional Science program offers 14 tracks, all designed for people that want to stop talking about problems and get to solving them. The tracks include applied remote sensing, aquaculture, broadcast meteorology, climate and society, coastal zone management, exploration science, fisheries management and conservation, marine conservation, marine mammal science, natural hazards and catastrophes, tropical marine ecosystem management, underwater archaeology, and weather forecasting. In conjunction with the University of Miami School of Law, the JD MPS track is also offered, allowing students to focus their studies in the Department of Marine Ecosystems and Society, saving 12 credits over earning the degrees separately. You'll earn your degree in 15 to 18 months, spending most of that time on Rasmus's famous Virginia Key campus, located minutes from downtown Miami along Biscayne Bay. The MPS program experience consists of two components, coursework and internship. Course study is designed to build the foundational knowledge required for a profession in that track subject matter and can include on-site study in locations like Panama, Mexico, the Galapagos, the Florida Keys, Bonaire, China, and Chile. Because life happens mostly outside of a classroom, the second phase brings students into a real-world job experience through an internship. Internship opportunities are available in various federal agencies, NGOs, and the private sector, with organizations such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Park Service, and the Nature Conservancy, to name a few. 
the goal of the internship is to provide students professional experience, networking opportunities, and a head start in securing job placement upon graduation. Most graduates secure employment within six months of graduation, while some use the experience as a pathway to doctoral, law, and veterinary degree programs. For more information about the Rasmus MPS program at the University of Miami, including application deadlines and alumni spotlights, visit mps.rasmus.miami.edu. So everybody asks, what is the difference between a regular MS and MPS? And I always kind of say, not very much. Um, for us, whether you're a PhD, an MS, or an MPS student, it's all the same classes. There's no difference in those classes. The biggest difference ends up being the MS is your regular MS program, where it's two years, you are working one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member on kind of one of those problems that the faculty member already is doing research on right so um just that regular ms when you get, look at the mps you do all of your academic coursework in the first two semesters so you knock out all those classes up front and you actually go into a job or an internship where you are doing that hands-on work in the field people really 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 like this degree because whenever you are starting to apply for jobs for example they always ask okay well you need one to three years of experience. And it's like, well, how am I supposed to get one to three years of experience when I've literally been in the classroom my entire life, right? So this degree allows students to get some of those experiences that they can add to the resume or CV, which can then allow them to go into a job once they graduate. Um, most students will finish this program in about 15 months. So you do those first two semesters, all, um, all your coursework and then that summer into the next fall, you are doing your internship or job and then you graduate in December. So we talked about those 14 different tracks. Um, some of the ones that have been booming lately, to be honest, aquaculture is one of those areas that, um, you know, people are getting offered jobs before they are graduating and it's, we're having to go back to them to be like, can you turn in your paperwork please? So you can, you know, officially graduate. Um, climate and society, a lot of work with sustainability, resiliency, um, obviously work with climate change. Exploration science is another one where it's a lot of work with ROVs. Um, you've got fisheries management for a lot of students who are interested in going on to a PhD later. A lot of students will go that route from the fisheries management side, a lot of quantitative work on that side. You've got marine mammal science is always one of the most competitive tracks. Uh, we only take about 12 students in that track because we want to make sure that once you finish, there's a job available. We could easily take 40, 50 students in that track, but we know what the job outlook is for each of these areas. We want to make sure that our students are getting those top jobs. So that's why we put caps on all of these tracks. Natural hazards and catastrophes, another one of those areas where students are getting job offers left and right and probably making some of the most money from that one specifically. Um, we have people who are working for insurance or reinsurance companies for FEMA, um, lots and lots of different opportunities that are out there. Your marine conservation, of course, is super broad for a reason, because you can go on the side of sharks and sea turtles or working with policy or pollution or education and outreach and kind of everything else in between. Tropical marine ecosystem management, doing work with corals and seagrass and mangroves. Um, and then, of course, weather forecasting, you're, you're going to be doing the meteorology work. Underwater archaeology is, is a little bit longer process. It usually is about a two-year program. Um, but yeah, in essence, that's, that's most of our different tracks there. Um, so we kind of talked about the internship. Um, getting that hands-on experience is really what we want. We want you to be able to do that research in the field with organizations like NOAA, the National Park Service, but it can literally be anywhere in the world. So we had pre-COVID, I should say. Um, hopefully this starts up again this, this upcoming summer, but we've had students go to Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Panama, United Kingdom, all over the West Coast on the California side or Oregon, Washington, all up back to the Northeast and even students who come from the Midwest who are like, I wanna go back and do some work over there. So um, we've, we've got connections everywhere, which is the nice part. So usually um, students are trying to figure out, okay, what is the best option for me? Just some fun facts, um, about six months post-graduation, 94, 95% of our students are have that job in the field, which is great. That's really the goal of this program is to get people um, those job opportunities. 
we probably send about 10 to 15 or so on to other degrees such as vet degrees or PhD opportunities as well once they finish with this degree too. Um, we do offer tuition based um, tuition waivers based on merit. So we talked about that GPA being really the only thing that we're looking at as far as the waiver. So we got that 20% waiver at a 3.6 GPA or higher from your undergrad or a 10% waiver from that GPA of 3.3 or higher. You do not need to take the GRE. I'm going to say it again. You do not need it. But if you kind of fall in that middle of the ground kind of space between that 3.3 and that 3.59, I always kind of encourage people to think about taking the GRE if it's going to get you some free money. Um, free money is always a good thing. So um, if students kind of fall on that, I, I usually encourage them to go that route. We do have an internship report that's due at the end of this degree. With your MS, you're doing um, a thesis. Your PhD, you're doing your dissertation. For MPS, it's more of an internship report. Some students will make it out to be a lot longer, like a full-out thesis, um, especially if they're interested in going on to, um, to a PhD afterward, or maybe they want to get this published then more, more people will go that route, but otherwise they're just kind of going off of what they did during their internship. We also offer the Rosenseal Opportunity Award, which those are actually past the due date for being due this year, but keep in mind, it's gonna be the same due date every single year, where we will offer four, four awards that will cover up to 80% of the tuition. So for students who get the Rosenseal Opportunity Award with that 20% waiver, you know, there's an opportunity to have 100% of that tuition covered. So um, the other thing I want to kind of mention on this um, before I wrap up is that um, I talked about the undergrads. Um, in undergrad, you can actually bring 12 hours from your undergrad to your grad. If you did your undergrad at the University of Miami, let me make that clear, and you took 12 hours over your minimum amount for graduation. So say the number of hours you needed was 120. If 12 of those hours were graduate level courses that did not count towards your undergraduate degree, those 12 hours can come over to the MPS degree and you're already done almost half of your degree at that point. So you might have those 12 hours, you might even have another six hours are covered by um, tuition waivers. So 50% of your degree is already taken care of. So I always encourage students to kind of think about what your future goals are. I know it's hard to do that, you know, your freshman, sophomore year, but you kind of want to make sure you've got that plan in place, especially going into the junior year to see if you can actually get some of those credits put in place. Um, so that's a QR code to kind of go specifically to my um, Calendly link. So there's my Calendly if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one chat with me. Feel free, that's my phone number up there. Feel free to shoot me a text if you have any questions. And of course, my email address is there too to kind of help out. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll kind of take some questions. Got about seven minutes left. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So we do have some questions for you. So somebody is wondering, do you offer dual degrees, for example, a degree in marine biology or cons and conservation or a marine biology degree and under aquaculture degree for undergrad? So they wouldn't be specifically dual degrees. Um, the marine biology and ecology would just be that major. Now you can have a focus under aquaculture for that. And we've had several students who have taken a lot of those aquaculture classes during that time, um, but it wouldn't be a dual degree per se. It would just be that marine biology and ecology with a focus in those areas. Awesome. Someone else is wondering, um, do you offer like a fifth year master's degree? So, so yeah, just like I was kind of talking about that master of professional science, that would be like your fifth year, fifth year option. So if you can take those credits and, and put them towards that master's degree, then you can get those done and have five years, have the undergrad and have the, the master's degree as well. Awesome. So someone is wondering, um, for PhD or grad programs, do you offer scholarships? Um, how would they find out about that? So for PhD, it's all specific to uh, those assistantships. And those assistantships, um, to be honest, the best way, I'm trying to get there right now, would just be, I mean, I would just Google Rasmus, R-S-M-A-S, graduate assistantships. It's the first thing that pops up on Google. Um, those are the assistantships that we are specifically hiring for. So, and those are all fully funded. We do not offer or will not even give an offer for acceptance to a PhD without, without it being fully funded. So um, if you get the offer, you're probably going to want to take it because it's going to it's going to be absolutely fully funded. You will not have to go look for that funding, look for that money. That's not how we do it. Awesome. Someone else is wondering, is it possible for them to complete two MPS programs? 
Man, I've had that question asked so many times lately. Um, as of right now, no. However, the nice thing is with the MPS tracks is that you can, um, only about 50% of the track is specific to, uh, like there's mandatory classes. So the other 50% allows you to kind of pick and choose some classes that you want to kind of make that degree your own. So for example, if you picked marine conservation, there might be three classes like a GIS class or stats with R and uh, marine conservation biology. Those might be three mandatory classes. The rest of the classes are, are there to kind of allow you to make that degree your own. So if you wanted to go take an aquaculture class, you could. If you wanted to go take coastal zone management classes, you could. We feel like that degree allows you to kind of make it your own. So then whenever you're going to apply for jobs, you've got the background that you really, really wanted instead of us telling you what, what you need. We just want to make sure those mandatory classes that are there are there because we're talking to our supervisors who are hiring students and that's specifically what they want to see. So for example, if you were in our tropical marine ecosystem management track, um, some of the mandatory classes are scientific research diving and um, MOCC boating. We know if you're going to work for NOAA or you're going to work for the National Park Service and you're going to be out in the field, you have to have those certificates and licenses. So we want to make sure that you've got all of those opportunities under your belt. So when it's time for you to go apply, you're not missing anything. Awesome. So someone else is wondering, um, can they have an associate's degree and still do the MPS program? Unfortunately, no. So we have to have at least a bachelor's to start that master's degree, but you could take that associate's degree and go apply it for the University of Miami's undergrad degree, go finish up about 60 or so hours. Um, and depending on how you lay it out, you could even get part of that or almost half of that graduate degree completed as well. So keep that in mind. Awesome. So I believe our last question is, what is your favorite thing about your school and the programs you offer? Oh my gosh, y'all. It's the drive over to our campus is one of the most beautiful things in the world. You've got this Rick, the Rickenbacker Causeway, um, which has downtown Miami in the background. You've got beautiful water surrounding you all over the place. You can see the cruise ships. You can see South Beach. You can see our key where we're located. Um, it's just beautiful. And to be able to literally go off your dock and go do your research is one of the coolest things in the world. You've got your own beach right there. You could, we've got students who will go fishing over there. We've got students who will just be able to go literally off the dock and go scuba or snorkel, go kayak, et cetera. So it's so nice to have all that right there. And of course, having all those different majors and areas that we're focused on um, allow us to be very hands-on in the field, you know, 365 days a year. There's times in January and February where a lot of schools, you're not even going outside, right? But for us, we are not only outside, but we are in the water and we're doing the work. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions we have and all the time we have today. So thank you again to Josh and to the University of Miami for presenting, and we wish you all the best in your next steps to all of our attendees. All right. Thank you all so much. Take care.